Yo, yo, yo. Welcome to another episode of the PDX Black Rose podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Christian, and we have another episode for you with AJ McCreary, who is one of the uh, founding team and also the executive director of the Equitable Giving Circle. And so we go back a little bit uh, back when we were doing the Thai Entrepreneurship Program uh, out here in Portland, Oregon, and uh, we really connected, uh, been following her story, and uh, she's been doing a lot of great things. And so excited to share a little bit of what she's doing with you all, especially based off of what has happened during the pandemic. And hopefully you can support her, uh, support the work that she's involved with, and uh, really just tap in with the, you know, the Portland culture, especially for black and brown folks uh, that are uh, making waves in this space. And so without further ado, let's get to know AJ McCreary. I wanted to take a break from the episode to let you know that we have some merch that is available. Over at Iltopia Studios, you can find the Black Superheroes Matter art book, which is a collection of illustrations that reimagine your favorite superheroes through the eyes of children of color. We also have a bunch of sticker packs, over 120 different sticker designs of your favorite superheroes. More importantly, we have our Color Me Super coloring book series. Definitely check out the merch at shop.iltopia.com or blacksuperheroesmatter.com. And now back to the episode. Welcome to another episode of the PDX Black Rose podcast. And today we have AJ McCreary. Um, we go back, what? We go back to like, you know, the tie days, you know, uh, what was that? Like 20, <laughs> what was it? Tw- was yeah, it 2018 or 2019? I can't even remember. It feels like a hundred years ago. Yeah. It was like another was- lifetime ago, right? <laughs> it was another, it was a whole different world. <laughs> Back when we could, back when, yeah. back when, you know, cohorts were in person. Rather than <laughs> yeah, things were in person when you didn't wear, you know, you could see everyone's face all the time. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When air wasn't scary. <laughs> yeah. When air wasn't scary, right? <laughs> where, the, where the biggest thing we had to worry about was like, dang, how am I going to park in downtown? You know, like. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. But. Yeah, you've just been uh, you've been moving, you know, taking you know taking strides with the with a lot of different things right now, especially things that like you weren't necessarily doing as much during uh, pre pandemic, and um, and so like how how's things yeah. like just how's things been with you? Yeah, things look like a total one eighty or three sixty or I don't know a whole bunch of turns, big turns. Um, the beginning of the pandemic. <clears throat> I'd been doing, you know, a bunch of cannabis work and art stuff and um, marketing and development on, well, being really picky about the marketing and development that I had been working on. And then um, myself and a group of women and femmes kind of pre-pandemic had been holding space and having conversations about the idea of creating a giving circle and we we're really loosely talking about rolling out some programming for, you know, fall of 2020. <laughs> um, and then the pandemic hit um, and I had just been at the Black Growers Gathering, really inspired by the farmers that I met there. And really it connected with me a lot growing up in Portland and farm to table is a, not a new concept here, access to being around farms or farmers, um, just because our close proximity to, you know, Sobeys Island, Hillsboro, Troutdale, and Hood River. Um, so <clears throat> not being in farm community, but seeing it, um, and also really resonating with the work of Booker T. Watley, who is the Black man out of t- who studied and worked out at Tuskegee University, um, who coined the idea of the CSA, which is Community Supported Agriculture. And it's really just the idea of having, you know, essentially city folks come help on the farm for a day or two and then they get produce. And so it was a way to tap into that, those resources of folks who had some, you know, farm experience or agriculture experience or who are interested in having farm or agricultural knowledge and experience. Um, So inspired by all that, I was like, hey, y'all, let's buy some CSA from Black and Brown Farmers it'll be cool. We'll like help 50 families. We'll help a handful of farmers. In a week after launching that idea, we'd raised $30,000. 
which covered our need for the 50 families for the summer. And so being the person that I am, I was like, we'll just double down. We'll help a hundred families. <laughs> Let's just scale uh, this. And they were like, well, not really how it works. And I was like, why not? Like there's farms everywhere. This will be fine. So um, then it kind of just in a really positive way imploded into us serving 350 families. Wow. Um, and in, in how, how much of a different time? Because like how much time from like 50 families to like 350 families? Because that's a big jump, right? Yeah, that was like six weeks at most. If Dang. That. that. <laughs> and it's like all feels like a blur. Yeah. So that first like June when we got started with like delivery and all of the things and all the details, it was pretty wonky. Like not going to lie. Because like... <clears throat> This idea, this work started, um, you know, we really started kind of loosely in December. This idea around the CSA, right, in February, we started kind of, not late February, early March. Um, you know, by April, we were in it doing the thing, moving, like fundraising. Um, and CSAs, because we were working with smaller farms in the beginning, uh, didn't really get started until June. So we had a little bit of wiggle room. Um, but that first June was really rough. It was just like all of the things that could be going wrong were going wrong. <laughs> it was crazy. Um, by July, we were rolling. We were good. We were serving at that point about 350 families um, with regular food support. So getting the CSAs from the farms. <clears throat> and getting those delivered to the families and the home delivery was really important to us as a whole group because one, we want our community and you know, we serve black and brown folks. We want our community not to have to be worrying about public transportation, having to worry about lugging, you know, a 50 to yeah. 20 box of food across town. Um, and we serve a lot of vulnerable folks. So, you know, elderly folks, um, folks with disability, folks who have, you know, single parents with, you know, small children um, and people that work. Right. So if you have a working, you know, not necessarily a nine to five job, but if you're doing a service industry job or you're working, you know, um, you know, in a job that is not respected and pays terrible, you probably also have wacky hours. And so then having to like access food service, you know, complicates things. So trying to like mitigate those things. And our entire leadership team, we all kind of think from a, a mindset of having to tap into these kinds of services because we've all needed help in a different one way or another. Mm -hmm. So we try to really think through that. Like, what would we need when we were needing these kinds of services? Like, what, what would be the best thing for us? <clears throat> and to be mindful of that, right? So um, by July, yeah, we were serving 350 folks. Uh, regular service um, and our program. So at that time, it was just the food, the weekly food box. And we serve the same families every single week. So it's the okay. food box and then also a once a month uh, protein. So, and we're really, really respectful. If, you know, if you are a halal family, you're getting halal meats. If you are vegan, you're getting vegan items. If you're a no pork household, you know, you don't get pork products. Um, trying to be really, really mindful of that for folks because a lot of food services are not. And yeah. as a person who doesn't eat pork, I'm super agitated to like even know pork stuff is near my food. So like I really am mindful of that. And our whole yeah. team is is really um, hold space for that. And what's happened since then now, the families, and we've, you know, fluctuated up to um, at the height during like uh, the – fall time. Um, and then through December, we were serving at the height 525 families. Mm. Um, and we've had a pretty good graduation. So we've seen a lot of families actually be able to take the money that they're saving on, um, you know, food service and be able to do really great things for them as a household. Yeah. Um, so yeah, now our program includes the meat and the, the weekly food boxes, but it also includes the weekly uh, pantry items. So, um, you know, we're sending out oatmeal, you know, pasta, rice, dried beans. Um, Dee yeah. Hopkins, our CSA director, 
is really, really great about getting coffee and beautiful teas um, and spices and all of the things that make cooking fun. Because mm-hmm. a lot of times if you're needing to access food service, you don't get you kind of have you know, the gourmet things or the fun things or the special stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Kind of nice. how we, we got rolling and um, it's been a really fast ride. Like it's been really fast. Well, yeah. I mean, you go from you go from saying, "Oh, yeah, we'll we'll do fifty in what June," and then literally a season later, two seasons later, you're you're talking about services for five hundred families a week, right? Like that is that is growth, right? Like that is exponential growth, right there, right? In a in a yeah. in a market that is uh or in an industry that doesn't necessarily see that type of growth. Right. Like it, it's a uh, like it, it's it's definitely like it's that's it's, it's different. Right. <laughs> like <laughs> I, just, I just don't even I, it is different and I don't see it as is really like that different. And I don't feel like anyone on the leadership team really feels or thinks that it's different. Like when we have these conversations, I think we all we think both in a really large scale and a large way. Um, And I would say the way all of our brains have been trained and have operated in real time, it's around big math, right? Yeah. Uh, You know, Lillian Green, who is our, one of our outreach directors, she has been done policy work. She's, you know, managed multi-million dollar budgets. She really understands big math. I've done a lot of development stuff on, you know, multi-million dollar projects, building stuff. And so I'm used to big math. Um, Divisha Gordon, she does a lot of stuff with the city and housing, right? And so, like, she is experiencing and around big math. Um, and I think that really impacts the way that we're able to organize in real time at the ground level, because we have so many people, you know, Keen Tolton Davis, she also does, she works with um, Albina Vision Trust. She's done stuff in Mayo House. She does a bunch of stuff all over the place. Yeah. Um, right. So like our board too, we're tapping into people who really on a regular basis interface with big math, but we're also really rooted into our community and we're really invested in serving our community in real time. And I think that combination where we're able to intersect as a group, that's where the magic happens. Yeah. And I, and I think that's really powerful because, you know, I'm sort of seeing that happen in sort of like the art and the tech sector right now, where, you know, I work with a lot of nonprofits in education, you know, I do stuff with PPS and, Hillsborough School District and Portland Public Schools or uh, Portland Community College and and all that. And so now I'm sort of seeing the benefits of, well, albeit because of COVID, right? Like we're talking about like post-COVID, during COVID times, uh, seeing how, you know, I go outside, I talk to people that are sort of dealing with the, the things that are affecting us in COVID. And I'm saying, okay, how can we help kids like learn better? How can we help kids you know, pick up these skills? How can we sort of mitigate the factors that that are disproportionately affecting our community? And then, you know, because I have the experience and, you know, I feel confident that I can sort of tackle these problems and do it at the liberty and do my people justice. And uh, but like there's there's that element of like, you know, like we live in the like we're tapped in with the community. We know what they're looking for. We know what they need. And we have access points that uh, we have the privilege of access points that uh, that allows us to navigate this space and, and open doors for other people. And it's like it's very nuanced. You know, it's really, really nuanced to where like you can't, you know, like there's there's parallels. But like it, it's. It, it's just so many nuances, right? Like you, you wake up and you don't really know what's going to happen every day, but you have an idea of what you can expect. Because you lived through yeah. these things, you know, for years, for decades, yeah. right? And I, and I think that really, like, you know, it sort of comes to, a, it comes to, it comes to, you know, fruition where it's like, you know, the experience and the comfortability and the connection that you made in the community meets the sort of the, the opportunities that sort of fall in your, fall in your lap or the opportunities or pathways that you want to pursue. 
And then at some point they sort of intersect and then you have an impact. And, and then it's just a matter yeah. of how do you continue that impact, right? So one of my favorite community elders, and I like I have so many favorite community elders, so I, I shouldn't say that, but one of <laughs> my favorite humans to talk to, Miss Bernie, um, a couple years ago, pre-COVID, on that exact topic of like that intersection of us understanding both the systems and this larger picture and narrative and this larger culture, you know, because like, you know, we've went to college, we've been in corporate settings, we've been in a lot of white spaces that like Miss Bernie, who's in her 70s, wasn't originally which at our age. I mean, she's done amazing things. She's literally done everything from been a arguing or a curator for the arts at within Kaiser to flying airplanes, driving school children and like everything in between. So like, such an incredible story um, in life that she's had. But we were having this conversation. I was having a bad day. And she really pointed out like that we are cultural translators. Like because we've been in those spaces at college, trained up in a way, but we're also really rooted in our community and grounded in community in a way that <clears throat> not everybody is. Yeah. That we are a type of cultural translator. And that is one of the reasons why that like she predicted a lot of what we're doing now before it happened, not around COVID, but she was like, no, y'all understand things. And y'all been trained in a way that, you know, we dreamed of being trained in. we dreamed of being able to have access points. Um, and now we have technology on top of it. So we get to create our own access points. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, it's so cool to see that like in real time, how it's manifested and how it's playing out. And then getting to witness that with other, you know, community members, peers, friends, you know, just folks that I see in the world that are like also able to have like that, you know, similar juxtaposition. Cause it's, you know, it's as shitty as things are right now. And I look outside and I'm just like, Ooh, I don't know about yeah. outside. I just want to go back <laughs> inside. We're at this incredible pivot, right? Like so many incredible things are happening. Yeah. Um, I'm really fascinated how the momentum will, will continue. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's a paradigm shift, you know, and, and it's a paradigm shift, not particularly in an industry, but just like across the board, like culturally. And, yeah. you know, I, I yeah. wouldn't say, I wouldn't say culturally, I would say just society is seeing a paradigm shift because if we say like it's culturally there's a you know like because if we say that like culturally like there's a paradigm shift you 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 technically it's sort of i mean it isn't like it, it's because like you know we still listen to the same music you know sort of the trends that we're seeing are still sort of they're going along the same path that we predicted right you know tiktok randomly arises and then Black culture sort of gets appropriated. And then, you know, the the paradigm shift is in society, black people with their culture, uh, they, they have the opportunity to police their culture in a way that, that that's unique. And, and you get to see yeah. that play out in real time. And so uh, and so uh, not so much a cultural paradigm shift, but really just a, a, a paradigm shift within society and how the structures are, are, are sort of laid out and who has access to those structures and and who has control over those structures. We're starting to see that become more democratized. And uh, and I'm all for that, you know? Like, I am all for that because, you know, it, it's a, it's it's something that, like, you you wanted to see growing up and, and, uh, and sort of that learned helplessness that you sort of, like, feel when you're like, oh, yeah, like, why don't we see these things, like, on big screens? Why don't we see these things in school? Why don't we see these things, right? Like we're actually seeing that people have agency to actually make those a reality now. And if somebody tells them no, then they'll just do it on YouTube or they'll do it wherever they want. And so um, it's a fun time to be alive. <laughs> yeah, we yeah, we have the opportunity to build our own audiences now too. Yeah. And like in a really... In a sustainable way, yeah. right? Like because... At first, it was like you sort of have to build an audience to the point where you can sort of get opportunity, more opportunities. You got to pitch it and you got to do all that. But now, you know, like you just need to know where to, you know, what keywords to look up and where to point and click. 
right? Like it, it's a, it's more about just like if you have the information, then there's tools available for you to uh, utilize that information to scale. And uh, and I think that that's that's really like a interesting point that like uh, I think you you like you guys have played out very well. You know where you know like you guys had the you guys kind of had the foundation or the seeds of a foundation to 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 put something into plan and then actually see it grow yeah i don't mean so we're we're definitely team building the ship while we're flying it um <laughs> we definitely are i do not want to um pretend that is not what is happening uh I, I I will say our team, our understanding of both systems and our, um, we are a team of like, let's get shit done. Yeah. Uh, that's all of our vibe. Like there's a will, there's a way. Um, I think we're all, we've heard no so many times and I think we're all fed up with that, which really fueled uh, problem solving. Um, and just, you know, we, we are people as a, a group that were very much raised by community in different ways. Um, and I think that that really fuels the energy to, to make things happen. Yeah. Um, and we, I think we're, I mean, we're all, some of us on our team have kids, some of us don't. Um, and we're all very vet invested in the future, whether it's through our, us having kids or being teachers or being aunties or, what have you, but very invested in a different experience. Um, and as an individual that, you know, has been on food stamps, has been like broke, broke, uh, trials and tribulations of, of poverty. I like, I used to be real, just like, I'm cool. Like I'm not going to a, a pantry. I'll figure it out. Like yeah. I cleaned houses because I was like, nah, I'm not going to go. It is less embarrassing to clean houses and to scrub someone's toilet than yeah. to go to a food pantry. And people were like, I was like, you're going to be treated like you're an idiot and you're the devil because you're hungry or you want your kid not to be hungry. I would rather go clean someone's toilet, get my little 50, $60. Um, then I learned that cleaning people's toilets actually is pretty lucrative and uh, not yes, the it, idea if you are broke. Um, Turn my life around with that. Um, <laughs> for real. But like, we really like, for me, that has been very mindful of like, if you are needing services, we have to do it in a way that you don't feel less than. And that mm -hmm. it is bait, like that you're getting services based off of it. We care, right? Yeah. So we get up and do this work because we genuinely care about our community. We get really excited about the, like how we get to show up. Um, I was just at the workspace this morning and Dee Dee got in some microgreens, some beautiful microgreens and some like different kinds of microgreens, which I didn't realize that microgreens had such a variety. Like there's some with purple stems and like, <laughs> and you know, it was just like a buzz of excitement of like, this is something different and that our families are going to get just because, right. Yeah. And I think also this morning kombucha came in. So like, oh, easy. <laughs> yeah. But, it, you know, it, it's it's fun, like to like it's really fun to share things with folks, especially fun, like food that's like would either be, you know, oftentimes out of our budget or just special or something interesting to try. Right. Like I know personally, I'm not as inclined to try something that is expensive if I have never had it. Right. Like yeah. I'm not going to probably just going to go with what I know that I already like and is going to be a hit in my household. So yeah. it's, you know, it's, it is genuinely fun to, to share. And like, we get really excited about getting good stuff for the folks that we serve. It's, it's pretty much the best part of my, my job. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think it's, it's liberating, right? Because, yeah. um, because you, every action, when you get to a point where you're sort of pinching pennies together and, you're sort of trading your time for money, you know, then the value of things uh, take on a whole new concept in your life. Right. You know, okay. like that, that $60 box of freaking, you know, uh, top tier noodles or whatever, you know, if that doesn't hit, you know, you gotta, you're going to feel it. Right. Like, 
that if you're working for ten dollars an hour, it's like t- it, like that better be worth six hours of work. You know, seven, eight hours of work after taxes, right? Like you, like there's some, there's an actual like physical consequence to, yeah. uh, to the things that you, um, you know, the things that you sort of invest in as an ex- as experiences, whether they're for nutritional value or anything like that. And so, providing an opportunity to have people have these experiences without the physical toll that it takes to get them is, um is something that, uh, at least for me, I'm growing to like appreciate now, right? You know, I play football, I already have hip surgeries and I freaking, my shoulder hurts every time I wake up. Like it's, you know, yeah. these things have physical consequences and even to get to this point of comfortability. And so, uh, and so I think it's just really good to, uh, to see that there's people providing opportunities to, uh, to lower that bar of entry just for people to just live, you know, live with, live with a sense of agency. And, uh, yeah. and, and that, you know, I, I think that that's something that like, you know, my parents' generation and like my, you know, our generation, we, we start to see a shift, but like, we're really starting to see that like, you know, quality of life doesn't have to come at the expense of like your life, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Well, and like, we deserve the best. Like this was, um, we had a, a donor, like an in-kind donation of food donor that wanted to give us um, expired things. And they were like, well, it's fine. Da, 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 da. And I think multiple people on the team have been like, I, we didn't told this woman we good. Like this, that's not our vibe. It's not like we understand that expired goods are still good past the expiration date. It, there's yeah. all, this, you know, foolery with the USDA and, policy and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. It's all about, money. but it feels different for something to show up and be, you know, a day it's, or two yeah. or, or expired. Like it's leftovers. It feels different. And it was really interesting. Like she could not grasp it until I said, well, how would you feel if I invited you over to dinner? And, um, after I served you dinner, I'll let you know that I have pulled that out of like a garbage can. And she was like, excuse me. And I was like, well, it's kind of like the expired. I mean, it's not the same, but it was like, it was but like it, the thing that made is, her think like, oh, not saying that there's anything wrong. Like if that is your only option to, to you know, yeah. sustain, to dumpster vibe, I'm not knocking that. But I, I do know culturally, we not really excited about that. Yeah. You'd be like, you did what with this? Where well, this it, it's, I think it's a, it's, it's a it feeds into that uh it feeds into the idea of being lesser than already mm-hmm. right where like you know if you had this service and it's supposed to really make you uh give you this experience and it and it makes you feel some like makes you feel uh like you should feel you know like feel worthy of something and then you look at the expiration date and you see that number you know that has a very real consequence to it right yeah. it you know, it, it has a very real consequence and that and that can that can be antithetical to the mission to the point where like, you know, you taking you taking that and then giving it to three people d- completely obliterates all the work that you did up until that point, you know, because yeah. you got to build trust. You have to you have to like it, it's it, it's really damaging. And well, I also want to train like I don't want like, not train in a negative way, but expose and help relearn and reconnect that we deserve the best right for generations black and brown people have been getting the short end of every stick uh been oppressed on purpose starved of resources overlooked and abused and a whole bunch of other things that happened Mm -hmm. and so we have been conditioned to be you know okay with second best or leftovers or this will work because it's something um i'm not saying like and i love to vintage shop and i love like i have oh, a yeah. whole day planning on going yard sailing on saturday like that's a thing but i as i've gotten older and in different experiences i've got to experience like luxury or being well taken care of or having access points these are experiences our community deserves every single day at every single intersection, right? Like, yeah, can't just be 
some people get access to nice stuff and other people who do not. And like, so really helping our community learn and experience that. And also getting to interface with white folks and retraining them because there's a lot of white folks who haven't experienced any level of poverty or any level of oppression or any level of really discomfort. Yeah. They really haven't put any thought into how would you feel getting literal leftovers? How would you feel getting, you know, holy shoes or, you know, something that was broken or moldy or expired? And so we get to really interface on in that way too. Of, and even the government level, like y'all could be doing better pretty easily, yeah. you know, so like that I get really excited about just like across across the, the board, being able to help us relearn and, and re-engage in, in the way that we experience resources, because this earth, we have enough for everybody. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. It's overpopulation. <laughs> Look at it. Yeah. It, like we have so much that like we waste so much and we still have more, right? Like yep. that, that's, that's, that's the, you know, one can argue that like it's an unsustainable model, you know, over the over the next 100 years, you probably don't want to do that. But that's a different conversation, right? Like it, it's a uh, um but you know, like it, it it is what it is. With technology, before you know it, you know, like there's going to be, you know, you'll have plant-based burgers that bleed and and stuff like that. <laughs> like it, it's a it, We're there to have that. <laughs> yeah. No, we like I I just got um I just got, I found out about freaking uh, Restaurant Depot over by the Walmart. Yeah. Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. <laughs> oh, my gosh. When I tell you, I've never been so proud to be a business owner because I go in there, you know, those, uh, the jalapeno poppers, like those jalapeno cheese bombers that you could only find at like, the re like at the fast food places, right? The ones with the cheddar cheese and the real jalapenos in there. The ones that like Safeway or, or like Fred Meyer's, you only get the ones with the cream cheese. Those things suck, right? But you get the ones, you get the ones with the cheddar, mm -hmm. the cheddar, man, changes the game, right? And so it's yeah. like I found out, yeah, they, that's the only way you can. That's the only way you can find them is there. And so, and so they got those and then, uh, and then you could actually get like the impossible burgers, like the, mm -hmm. the impossible burgers with the, or you get like a big box of like 40 or something like that. And so, uh, and so for me, I was like, I went in there, I saw those things. I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good for the rest of the, I'm good for the rest of the rest of the summer. Right. Like it, it, it changed the game for me. And so it's like, but having that experience of access, right. That experience of access where it's like. I want a bur I want a burger. I want something that's plant based. I don't want to sort of compromise on taste. I want to sort of have the opportunity to experience that without having to ask gatekeepers, right? Just yeah. being able to just go there, get it, get out, have it in my have it in my home and enjoy that experience and feel good about it, right? Like that that's something that like I I haven't had the opportunity to do. Uh but once I got that opportunity, I want to find ways to have it again, you know, and, and, and I think that's a driving motivator for me, at least where it's like, oh, this is, you know, there's another purpose for me to just do things. And, you know, and, and it could be trivial, but, you know, those little experiences are the, di the difference between having a pretty decent day or a pretty good day, you know? As, yeah. Like, well, so much of our culture is around food. So access to food that resonates with us it is nutritious nutritious and that like we like um and that is exciting is a really important part in reclaiming culture and you know i don't just mean like soul food and i don't just yeah. mean you know, like bison um but just even the relationship with food that it's can be celebratory and that it should be an experience i love that you're like this is an experience this is an important like start to finish there are points of this that are experienced that like meet, you know, meet the needs that like make the make or break the day and like make or break how this feels. That is such an important part about our relationship with food. And we don't get to talk about that and we don't get a hold space for that. And 
that should be like everything around food should be both a celebration. It should be about being an experience. My kid, this is like the most amazing thing and the most irritating thing ever. Like meals with him are like, if he had his choice, every meal would be like two and a half hours long. No <laughs> exception. Like we would sit there and eat slowly. And like, even if it's at home and like, <clears throat> You got to get up and do stuff or whatever, but every meal would be like a, a true pause, right? And it is the most beautiful. And also as a parent, a person who's just like always trying to go and do stuff, yeah. I'm like, I love it. And I'm also like, bro, this is not sustainable. But like <laughs> that pause and like his relationship with food being an experience and really an opportunity to break bread and converse and to be pause from all of the chaos is so incredible and like i hope that in this work and just other work that is happening that we can keep changing and re you know like reestablish relationships with food in a healthy way because like i'm a eat over the kitchen sink real fast and like run up the door <laughs> kind of a person and like that's so unhealthy right it's <laughs> it's, it's not an experience. like it, it's a i think you know, as I'm like hearing like me growing up and, and hearing like friends at school saying like, oh, yeah, we have like dinner as a family. I'd be like, what? Like what time your parents get home from work? Because my my mom don't get home from work till 930, 930 p.m. And so I'd be I'd be damned if I got to wait till 930 to eat, you know, like I'm not like that's not happening. And so it and so for me, like hearing like hearing that as like that being an expectation of like being able to sit down and have conversations and like slow down as you're, you know, as you're enjoying a meal, like that was always seen as like a luxury. It's like, Oh yeah, it must be nice. Like, you know, you don't like your freezer's not stacked with TV dinners. Cause you, you don't know how to cook and you know, like it, it's, it just must be nice. And so it, it's a, and so we're seeing like, it's good to see that like we're seeing that, you know, like kids these days are like, that's not their, that's not their default experience. And, and we're seeing that people are starting to experience that and appreciate it. Cause I remember when, you know, that was just a dream. It's like, what y'all like, you guys have dinner as a family. That's wild. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. yeah. Just, yeah. It's, it's fascinating like in this work, just talking to people with different, like different relationships with food, different experiences and how, I mean, one of my favorite things is when people know that they're going to have access to food, how that changes, right? Like yeah. one of those, it is, it is a moment to breathe, right? Like food is going to be here. Like I don't have to stress or worry about that because and food is, you know, like that's a, that's a basic need. It's critical. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a lot of weirdness because how we treat, you know, like food pantries, how that experience is, how food stamps works, how just even like free and reduced lunch, the way people are treated and like the kind of quality and all of that, it really impacts the relationship people have with that need. And so to help people have a shift and start to kind of decolonize their relationship with food is the best thing ever. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, uh, you know, because I, I remember like when I got when I got on Snap, the one thing that like I grew to appreciate is sort of um, because often like as you're as you're growing up and all these things, you sort of look at food as like I need food to like survive and I need it, but I ain't got that much money. So I need to find a way to make it stretch. Right. So like those meals that would probably take a one sitting, you probably make it stretched like, you know, a meal and a half. Right. Like or you'll or you'll have, you know, pizzas and you'll you'll get the deals and you'll do all these different things to like make the money stretch long, like further along. Right. And uh, and so I, I found that uh, whenever I would have like a, a good day or I feel stretched or whatever or stressed or whatever, um, one thing that I found is like, I'm sort of a, I'm a glutton for Oreo cookies and Ben and Jerry's. Right. And so like two things that like, I always saw was like a celebration or like a luxury, you know, I might get, I might just like get a pack and I just will enjoy it once a year or something like that. 
whenever I was just like, you know, I could just use a W today, right? I'll just go to the mini mark. I'll just get it. And I'll just, just stop, you know, things will stop. And I just enjoy it. I just gather my thoughts. I relax and I'm just not doing anything, but just sort of being in the moment. And, uh, and I started to appreciate just, uh, just that outlet um, and having peace of mind that like, this isn't going to cost me, you know, more because it's like Oreos ain't really cheap unless you getting them at the, you know, getting them, you know, on a deal or whatever, like you, you know, for like four or $5 for some Oreos, that that's like, that's like a half, half hour to an hour worth of work right there. You know, that you gotta, you gotta, you gotta do. And so, uh, and so just like little things like that, I, I've like grown to appreciate because, um, before it was just like work, 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 work. And then, you know, if you need to sleep, sleep a little bit, but then get back to work. Uh, but the idea of just like, spending money and then taking time off to to regroup and 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 not having that be a big consequence i was like huh this is this is this is this is, this is soothing you know and yeah yeah i mean even yeah and it's food is it's, it's comforting too like it's a part i love that like even just like i love that you equate dollars to how much time that take that like we're that exchange because I feel like that's such an important way to look at capitalism and this exchange regarding labor and what we're buying and what we're getting um and that's so beautiful even like the need to like being able to have access point around food for celebrations or just for a pick-me-up right like yeah. I'm having a rough day and I want whatever my favorite thing is but wait in real life, we have to like do that whole, you know, that math problem, like <laughs> how much work, how, like, how much it costs. You know. I, I hope that we can continue to like move away from that. I really, I wish that we lived in a, an economic ecosystem that wasn't a monolith, right? Like yeah. there is some healthy competition that could come from capitalism, I guess. But like, there's so many things that don't make sense in capitalism, healthcare, education, transportation, like public transportation, you know, like, yeah. list, you know, there's so many other things that like, this does not compute water. It, it's, it's a, it's, um, and I always, and I always like played around with this, right? Because uh, when I was a uh, first starting like my company, I was like, do I want to do a nonprofit or do I want to do a for-profit, right? And, uh, and I really played around with the idea of like, okay, like my, the company that I want to start, the purpose is to, um, you know, obviously get out of, you know, relative poverty, you know, and, and having, creating opportunities to do work that I feel passionate about that just wasn't, I just didn't have the opportunity to do, but it's also to have an impact in a community that otherwise would not see that impact if, if I didn't exist. Right. And so I was like, okay, well I could do the work. That's not really a, that's not really a problem. It's really about, you know, when it comes to structures and uh, having a financial structure that, that allows me the, the agency, it was like, well, you know, I create stuff. If I create good stuff, then I'll be able to make a lot of sales and then those sales can then fund all the other things, right? Uh, and and I, I, I gravitated towards that to where I was like, well, you know, if I do what I say I'm going to do, then I could fund all the impact ventures that I want. And, uh, and I wouldn't have to be, you know, I wouldn't have to do as much paperwork. I just got to do my taxes, right? Like you do your taxes, you're good. Money's coming in. You can do whatever you want with it. Pay Uncle Sam, go from there. Uh, and I settled on that um, because I felt comfortable. Uh, but with the with the the nonprofit realm, which is where I'm like doing a lot more work, interestingly enough, um, I'm seeing that it's a it's a different it's a different uh, you know you're able to do the work and you're able to have the impact. And if you find if you hit that like happy medium of like where the funding is going and where you exist, you're sitting good pretty you're sitting pretty good too. And uh, and, and so it's a uh, it's a, it's a, I don't know. I guess I'm just fresh to the scene. So I just need some more, I just need some more years under my belt. But it, it's a. Nonprofit 
thing is a real interesting because <laughs> it depends on how you're getting funded. Some nonprofits yeah. are, are mm-hmm. really are funded through government funding. And yeah. that's a great way to go. Like if you can, like that's really is more like the vibe that I am. These foundations are unethical and it's a hot, crazy ass mess, right? Like yeah. getting funded through foundations, it's a whole lot of hoopla. It's not very generous. The the wealth hoarding of like within the philanthropic community is really disturbing. Um, it's not, you know, it's not ethical at all. It doesn't really make sense. If your whole organization is to fund good work, how are you sitting on like a billion (laughs) dollars? Like, how is it also, this is a real foundation here in town. How is it that your expenses are $50 million a year, but you only give out $40 million a year? Hmm, Shouldn't you fund more work? than like having expenses just like your math is weird um yeah and unethical <laughs> you know so like <clears throat> there's a lot of that that goes on there's there's also a disconnect just in terms of like the community really at large thinks that the way nonprofits are funded and how that all works like there is a disconnect in that um like truly there's a disconnect there with the general public. And so it's like, no one really buys into nonprofit or good work, community work. Right. So it's sort of like begging all of these entities, whether it's the government, the foundations or philanthropic community or the, you know, corporations to do giving as a tax write off because nonprofits and philanthropic work really is just a legal money laundering. It's a tax show. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's, uh, like, which is unfortunate, right? Because it, it's it's literally just treating people as pawns. Right. It, it's. Well, but no one talks about it like that. The first the very first time that I like really was like grasping this, I was like 27 years old. Um, I was working for a company in New Orleans and I was sitting at this table with like all these dudes. And I kid you not, I was hired because in development, like I put on a dress and look great and I can talk to anybody. That's why I was hired. Not really based on anything else. It was very predatory, problematic, like in development, being a female is really eye-opening. So we're in this room and I'm taking notes and I'm like, okay, so we're doing what with this? We're, We're working with American Cancer Society. And I'm like, wait a minute, if they donate to this and then how many times is the same dollar getting the tax write-off? And like, (laughs) that was one of my questions. My other question was, or like, this is a little bit later. And I just said, well, like, so this, this is like legal money laundering. And my boss, I kid you not, got up from the other side of the table, dragged me out of this room like I was a child screaming in church like by the arm and was like look now you can write all the little questions down we can talk about it later but this you cannot do this in here and I was like so then your reaction that this is legal this is indeed legal like all you had to do was shake your head yes or no like you just confirmed my question to everybody that this is legal money laundering that this is indeed unethical problematic and weird Okay, cool. Thank yeah. you, sir. Um, like, I, it was a wild experience. Like, it was a really wild experience. And a lot of people don't really understand, like, that is what it is. Like, if you are really caring about this kind of work, you don't need a tax write-off. You don't care. And most people actually don't give enough the way that the laws are. They don't yeah. make enough, give enough for it actually to do anything. Like, when you go to Goodwill and you drop it back close, that seven dollars and forty seven cents that they said it's worth, it doesn't. You don't get that. You it's know, like, it's, it's not it's how it works. For what? Yeah. And you know, if you donate five hundred dollars, it's still probably not enough. Like you literally would have to make like thirteen thousand dollars, and then you wouldn't be giving five hundred dollars. Yeah. <laughs> like those ratios. Yeah. And so it's. I think like we have to talk about what this industry really is and what is actually happening more. Like I would not recommend people be doing getting into nonprofit work unless they really have a plan of 
how it's going to be funded. And I don't come from a nonprofit background. I come from a corporate and small business background and then been doing consulting for a while. And so I've gotten to work with a little bit of everybody and I've interfaced with a lot of nonprofits, but this it's not in a nonprofits in general, even if there is white saviorism and all kinds of issues like that and community, like there is a lot of, you know, issues around that. There is a lot of incredible work happening. And so I would never take away like the amazing work across the color line, across the world happening under the umbrella of a nonprofit. But how we fund this work, what is happening, all of the nuances in it, this is wild. Yeah, it, it it's, I think it's a, it's for, for people that get into it and they think it's a different way. Uh, from my perspective, do it being on sort of the, being in a lot of rooms and in a lot, in a lot of conversations with nonprofits trying to get stuff funded, mm-hmm. the overwhelming feeling that I got was like, me personally, I'd rather just make something cool and have and just get a whole bunch of sales. Cause mm-hmm. if I if I, I could replicate that, I can't I can't replicate every single having to go through application season and grant funding season. I'm like, oh no. Like, oh no. Like this ain't and, this ain't for me. And grants really are we gonna ask you the same four questions, 30 different ways. And we gonna see by the end of it how much of an attitude you have, <laughs> and that is literally how we gonna grade this. So the you know the fifteenth time I've asked you this question, if you call, if I read it, and it sounds you short, sounds rude, you just no longer care. They're gonna be like, we're not funding them. It literally is like, <laughs> how much can we harass you with the same fucking question? And then will you lose your marbles and be professional or not? Like, because it's not. Ne- at literally- the end, it's, it's like, at the end, it's like, oh, you mad? Well, you could go, you could apply to somebody else. It's like, <laughs> yep, it really like, is. They're like, oh, we don't wanna work with y'all. You're cranky. Um, is, you know, it's. Something else. And my favorite with the whole grand cycle, like the whole calendar of it is crazy. They'll be like, well, we don't want to fund. There, this is a funder that said to me, well, we're, we'd be really interested if you wanted to do X, Y, and Z. Well, we don't do X, Y, and Z. How was that the email? Like, why would you like <laughs> another one was, well, if you guys, you know, as you, when you guys grow a little bit further, we'll be interested in funding you. Well, if you don't fund us now, how are we going to get there? How how, how are we going to grow? <laughs> I asked them that. And she was like, oh, that's a really good question. I was like, well, how about this? Why don't you go talk to the board about that? Because I don't know how y'all miss that. Like, if you want to work with us, how come you can't work with us now? Why do I have to wait three years till it's to grow into what? Like, this like, is confusing to me. And she came back and yeah. she was like, you know, you're right. I think we'll have to, like, we're still, like, in conversation. She's like, I think, I think you're right. That is... That didn't make any sense. No, it doesn't make sense. How? Yeah. <laughs> it's, if you want, it's, uh, if you, it's worthy, why would you not help us get to a larger, more stable place? Or they want to know what is your long-term funding, but if you go the grant route, they only do a year, you, maybe to five years. You don't have long-term funding if you are going, like, what long-term funding? Like, what? what like, like oh, we invested in a grant writer that, like is on the board of trustees for like it like what like how do you how do you have that like that 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 was the thing that got me i was like oh because for you know like if you're not familiar with it you think that like oh yeah nonprofits are cool like they got this funding and they're able to do this if they're hitting they're hitting right like they got all this stuff and then you realize that they are they are stressed out every single year at the very same time and they either didn't spend all the money that they needed to spend bef- before the time is up or they need to figure out how to renew the, the funding that they had. Uh, and God forbid a, a funder changes this, you know, changes things. Mm-hmm. Then they're, then they're scrambling. Right. And I was like, or positive. this is wild. Like, I think it's the, like the women's foundation or something. So they reached out to us. I had a lovely interview with them. Like they just wanted to talk to us. Um, Come to find out they're not doing grants right now for anybody because they're having an ED change 
And so anybody who had been using them as a funder, like, because sometimes just... if you have a relationship, you can like, some sometimes you can have like, oh yeah, well, they will always be funding us or whatever. Like, they're, Yeah, yeah. If they're it's along with the mission, you know, they'll be stupid yeah. to discontinue it. You know, so, that... Yeah. Yeah. There's some sort of reliability, you know, once you have relationships, depending on how big the foundation, blah, blah, blah. But then like in reality, a found uh, a foundation or a fund at any moment can just say, oh, for the next 18 months, for whatever reasons, we're not fun. Like our staff is in place. But we're not funding anything. It's like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> and, yeah. you know, it's really interesting because like, the way we've operated at EGC in this last, you know, year and a half, we've, you know, worked through the fires, we've worked through the snow, we just worked through extreme heat. Yeah. And so this idea of like pausing just so that we can have these, like, I don't know, whatever experiences so that we can like have some sort of peaceful kumbaya transition if you will like it's it's something that like really doesn't resonate right like it's just like it, it's that- like the epitome <laughs> of a first world problem right mm-hmm. like it's literally like when they see like first world problem memes like this is literally it yeah. it's like oh yeah like what happened like oh yeah they they decided to go on vacation for like a, for 18 months and so you know we got to figure out what to do until they come back it's like, like what? <laughs> like what? It's hella, hella wild. Like, yeah, it's, it's like for me, because it's like, I'm okay with like there being seasons to like do things. And so like some seasons will be up, some seasons will be down. You have sort of general operations. And then, you know, there will be the waves that you sort of got to catch and you got to sort of figure out what to do in sort of the bear times, right? But a complete pause, like just sort of like, we're just going to stop and then we'll pick back up where we left off. Like, but your staff, like nobody can hold it down. (laughs) Like, And for me, that makes me really think real hard about let's always have a model that like, and right now it's still global pandemic, right? So it's still COVID is happening. So I'm like, well, if something happens and I can't be we need to still be able to operate and function yeah. without my presence. Just, mm-hmm. you know, like not that I want anything to have to anybody, to me or anybody on our team, but we have to be able to have a model where it is not, you know, dependent on one individual to make it tick yeah. because, you know, we're talking about a foundation that's funding, you know, a co- you know even a dozen programs that could be impacting tens of thousands of people, depending on what programs those are funding. Our program, you know, we serve about 2,500 people every single week. We have multiple employees. We have to be in a space where it's not just hyper dependent on, you know, one or two people, because that's a lot of people relying on something. Well, that's the, and that's a, that's a, that's a big responsibility for individuals to take, to have long term like it, it's a uh, even if even if like the model is sustainable you know sort of like money's coming in money's coming out and they're they're able to like operations are sustainable the i guess the operation is sustainable but the model isn't and so mm-hmm. uh and so it's like because to that point right we got the freaking delta variant coming up you know and taking over california right now and and so it's like you know <laughs> What do we like? What is next month or what is two months going to look like? You know, what is peak flu season going to look like? Like how it was last year, right? Like it, it's a there, it it's so much uncertainty in a world of uncertainty that like it could turn out good, but it also could not. And if it doesn't, then like what are those kind of like what does that impact? And uh, and so it, it's a. You know, I'm thinking about this because I'm, you know, going to medical school and I'm going to be in the thick of things. And so it's like, I got to start thinking about this because I got every vaccine, every possible vaccine that they will they will let you get or they will essentially let you get for school. Because 
you know, that's just what you got to do in the field. And so it's like, if I catch smallpox or if I get all these things, like all the other things, this podcast, everything is over, right? Like it's, it's over, you know, it it doesn't, you know, it can't go anymore. And so it's Mm -hmm. like, you know, how do you, how do you reckon with that? And how do you make something that can live on or sort of like have a legacy, you know, that, that people were able to pick up and continue like as you, you know, as you as a person try to navigate your life. And yeah, uh, I think it's a different way of being intentional with building, right? Like we, you and I grew up in a space of really hyper focused on the individual yeah. and hyper focused on, you know, what can I get for me and what can, you know, how does this benefit me? And we got to start building in a way that is very much more intentional about building for the community, building for, you know, long-term building in a way that, this can be passed on so that somebody else doesn't have to start from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I always think about like that sort of cultural idea of like, when you make it, then you can put people on, but like, you got to make it first. Right. And, and, and as much as it isn't that like, you know, sort of self-centered mentality, uh, it, it, it's, you know, it parallels it in many ways. Right. Like, you know, it, it's a, you know, because it, if you don't make it, then other people don't have the opportunity to, and, and that's what the consequence is. And, uh, and so sort of being able to turn that on its head and, and sort of having a team as you sort of go and embark on these things, it's like, yeah. you might not make it, but you know, your partner like might, and then, you know, then that opens up more doors for other people to make it. And, and, yeah. and it, it, uh, you know, it, it's just different. You know, it, it's a like it's just a different approach. We're still in a place of of so many firsts, though, too, and I think that's yeah. really important to honor and to acknowledge, right? Like, I remember going to college and how much of a big deal it was um, because I was like the first, like, yeah, in my dad's family to like really go to college, right? Like I went away and all the the things, right? And it was like a really big deal. And even my mom's family, really similar, like very few people had been to college. Um, And as I like moved on from that experience, and that was a really long time ago, (laughs) um, I regularly am shook by, you know, this is the first so-and-so to do this or the first, you know, yada, yada, yada. you know, EGC is one of the few, you know, black led nonprofits that raised over a million dollars. We raised, you know, over $2 million. That's not, there's not very many black women who are on the list of people that can say, I have raised over a million dollars. Yeah, no, it's. That hit me so hard when like, like I had heard that, but then certainly I was in a space where we were like, there was a bunch of black women who had raised over a million dollars for various things. Um, uh, and I was like, holy shit. Like I am in a group of less than 200 women. Yeah. The Mm -hmm. fuck? Like that. that, That's a, and and I think that's when the world starts to get smaller. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's like, Oh, you know, like, that person over there that you were reading about, you know, they're they're right there in the table right next to you. And then that person that you was watching that YouTube TED talk on, you know, they're sitting right there. And then it's like, you know, because uh, I think that I had that I had that as like things started to pick up with me in like the AR space where it was just like, oh, the people that I was watching TED talk videos on, I'm sort of in conferences with them now like this is yeah. this is wild and it's and so like then it's like wait dang am i like you know like am i having that impact am i like doing those things too like you you, you often have to sort of like take a step back and be like you know like me sort of having this imposter syndrome of like me not at the level that i need to be or that i want to be at but then i'm in these conversations it, it's a you know, it, it's a, uh, it feels like it feels good, but it does take like you, it does take, you know, there, that's a whole journey that you have to like go through to sort of like, ex- like claim that, but, like claim that sort of title and claim that, uh, claim that identity. I, yeah. I struggle with that a lot. 
yeah. like I'm I'm literally sitting here like, dang, I got to take the certification test and I'm suck. So I need to start from the beginning. And it's like the reason I'm taking the certification test is because I, I do this work. Like, why am I starting from the beginning? I just need to figure out what I need to improve on. Like it, it's a and uh, and it's a, you know, it, like it's just there's no. There's no, you know, blueprint or rule book for it. You you just sort of, you just, you know, you read stuff, you listen to people, you have conversations, you try things out, and then you just put your best foot forward. And if it works out, it works out. You know, you just do your best and put your, you know, just do it to the best of your ability. And, uh, and yeah, you know, I don't know. It's such as life, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> such as <is> life. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's. I'm excited for where we are are moving towards like I'm not team like 2021 we're like halfway through 2021 and it is definitely proven to be ill behaved yes and scary um but I'm super excited where we're going like as a as I see all of these incredible things that we're doing and that we're still like you know we're starting to pave the way that has been that has been like carved out for us and yeah, it's exciting. It's interesting too. Nice, nice. And so, <laughs> like, what uh, what are you the most excited about um, going into like the holiday season, right? Because like, before you know it, you know, fall is going to be here, and then we're in the holidays, <laughs> <laughs> and that's when things get crazy. Um, I so last year for the holidays we we chose to celebrate like as an organization, new year's. Um, and that for me is I'm really interested in reclaiming celebration, um, and community rituals, um, and honoring traditions and not just traditions that are rooted in capitalism. So like I struggle with I struggled with um, some Juneteenth events being centered around commerce. I struggle with birthdays just being hyper focused around presents. Yeah. Um, and we didn't do Christmas like as an organization last year. We did New Year's, and so we did. Um, we called them joy boxes, and they had just like little home good things, games, items that families could like get together and celebrate, and that were fun. Yeah. Um, and so I'm excited to be like, we'll get to start planning that by the end of August. And like, we'll start working on that and thinking through that and getting that together. And I'm really excited for that. And I'm really excited to be like doing more work. Um, right now, my like, I'm starting to have conversations with a variety of different elders about community traditions and rituals and um, celebrating in a different capacity. We had a with another group that I organized with, um, we had a Juneteenth second line, which was really magical. Portland doesn't really quite understand what a second line is, but we had fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like, I'm really excited to be, like, doing some more, like, research and community conversations around that. And then really getting to see that show in my work in a, a larger and a louder way. Um I have spent a lot of time in New Orleans, and so that is a city and culture that has really highly influenced um, my understanding of celebration in community togetherness. Yeah. And so I'm excited to both, like, really intertwine some of the things that I've learned in those spaces, but also the things that I've, you know, experienced here. I was a debutante in Portland with the Femmes, and I really mm. think that would be a very big celebration, like, way bigger than the Rose Festival, which is kind of creepy to me. Um, <laughs> you know, so I want to, I want to see like the things like honor, like traditions and stuff that are happening here in the city, you know, like celebrated and talked about and honored in a different way. La Femmes is um, over 70 years old. Uh, there's tons oh, wow. of, yeah, there's, it's, it's a really old organization over 70 years old or maybe just like the president is over i don't know i have to look <laughs> Some, somebody's over uh, 70 it's really old like they've been around for a long long time uh i can't go nowhere and like they're like oh, you're debbie huh? you're the film? yeah me too um <laughs> amazing network of people and it's you know it, it was started as a way to help young women 
learn how to be in community and network and um, how to be like, you know, finishing school kind of manner stuff. Le Femmes is the reason I went to college. Uh, I wouldn't have went to college without Le Femmes. And so, yeah, like how do we celebrate and honor those? Like the work that the Import Mosaic is doing, like how do we make that, like their work amplified and also celebrate and honor the people, you know, whose lives are lost, who yeah. homes were lost in a different way. Um, so I'm really excited about sort of like that being a much more significant part of my work. Um, we've laid the foundation of what we're doing as like EGC as a whole. And I think this is like a really important part of like community wellness for me and, and looking at community healing. Um, something I'm regularly talk to, you know, the city and the state, you know, government officials about is we celebrate who and what we care about, right? So if I care about you, I'm going to find different ways to celebrate you, whether it's my love language or your love language, right? So like with my kid, I know that food, right? Like I'll be like, we're going to go get food or I'm going to bring food home like that instant mood booster. It's a way that he feels seen and celebrated. It's one of his love languages, right? Like, so like for me, I love plants. I love flowers, right? So like I, when people bring those to me, I give them to people, like it's a whole thing. You don't see that with the city, right? Like, who does the city <laughs> celebrate? <laughs> you don't celebrate anybody. Like, yeah, I can is. honestly, by what y'all do, I cannot tell if you like anybody. Like, you really <laughs> yeah. don't like anybody. <laughs> it's and, like, if they left and fell off the earth, would you even care? Like, it, it's... <laughs> like, y'all do even... Like, so I'm really... I'm fascinated with, like, my conversations with them and showing them, like... This is also a way that you build community trust. This is also a way that you, you know, we honor people and respect people. Like in our own families, we see that like some family members seem to be celebrated more than others. Why? And what are the dynamics around that? Right. Yeah. Those are things that we unpack. We can take that same lens though to a larger sect. Right. And we see this regularly with how the black community is treated that we're not celebrated in any capacity. Yeah. Things are taken from us, whether it's resources or an idea or a dance, like constantly, right? Mm -hmm. So very interested and very excited to be just even having conversations about that. And and I get to spend more time with elders, which I really enjoy because one, it's like learning and it's also just like ridiculously funny. Like Yeah, it, it's a it's like my girlfriend is a uh she's going into geriatrics and so it's like she just tells me just everything that just it, it's just <laughs> she has stories for days <laughs> it's just it's just you know <laughs> it's just never ending i'm like dang like i thought kids were i thought kids were interesting like it, it's it's a whole nother beast man <laughs> It's hilarious. I, I have some elders that will come and like come to see me at our workspace. And like sometimes I won't be there and I'll get these hilarious stories that so-and-so came by to talk to you or whatever. And <laughs> it's always some like, they're just like real ridiculous stuff. And it's like <laughs> the, just, just the foolery. This elder um, the other day went, she went to the cooling the cooling center one because she was being nosy and <laughs> she was she was like i just want to see what was happening and i want to see if it was good and i had i had said that like i had originally wanted us to do a cooling center and if there is another heat wave i'm going to organize that because yeah her account of what the cooling center was was pretty ridiculous and it included a ferret like and Wait, so what? somebody brought a, their ferret which i guess you can't leave your ferret at the house yeah we, i under, yeah i definitely understand that and it's portland I, people got it, ferrets and stuff like i'm no judgment on your pet choices that's not part of the story but like the way that this elder came and told me about the cooling center including the ferret like i was in stitches and like that is for me i'm like Every time I talk to an elder, like, I get some crazy ass story that includes something ridiculously like, did you know there was a fair at the cooling center? No, I did <laughs> not. Like, I absolutely did not know. Oh, yeah. The attention to detail in these, in, in these, con in these experiences and then the ability to, you know, share it with others. It's, it's admirable. 
it's really admirable because I'm like, it's hot. I ain't paying attention to nothing except for what is on my neck and what is misting me in the face. Like, the, like yeah. it's, it's, uh, well, she yeah. had like, I mean, I felt like I had like low key experience, like experience, experience, the cooling center, like the details, the, like the animal experience, <laughs> the, the issues with accessibility, like just the whole, I don't know. I, I just, I also feel like it's always in addition to being extremely entertaining, there's always lessons of like, don't do this, do this, or like learning yeah. points. And so, yeah, I'm very excited that like regular part of my day, the next couple <laughs> months gets to include um, conversations with elders and just, and, and being able to like weave a lot of that wisdom into how like my work really, you know, plays out as an individual. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. It, it's a, uh... Yeah, well, hey, you know, just keep doing the good work that you're doing. You know, it, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's always good to see. It's like, you know, every every couple of days, I get this new Facebook notification of like, <laughs> you know, doing this and this and this. And I'm like, okay, yeah, we moving, we moving. Yeah, and, uh, we're having a really big like day party at the end of this month. We're gonna announce the details in a couple of days, um, but it's like gonna be centered around books and plants. Mm. So like it's a very Portland vibe. <laughs> yes, very very Portlandy books and plants, which is very interesting dichotomy, because it's like you need to kill plants to make books, uh, but then you need to, but then you, but then there's this sort of this big thing of, yeah, the whole yeah, you know, it's, vibe. A, it's 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 very interesting, very it's interesting. A vibe. It's a vibe, yes. right? <laughs> like it's a vibe, um, very Portland. So we'll be having that. Um, hoping to really pull in um, and connect like I'm in all these different spaces. So I'm really hoping to better like in this will be an event that'll connect both families, but like a lot of young professionals. This will be a BIPOC yeah. only event. It's going to be really fun. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Just let me know, you know, hopefully, cause I think I, I move at the end of the month, I'll be moving to Reno for school. And so, uh, so my time in Portland is coming to an end, unfortunately. Yes. But it's super exciting. Med school. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's a, uh, yeah, that's a, it's a, it's a thing, you know, things are, things are moving. And so, uh, you know, I'm trying to figure out ways to like, one, continue this project and, and still being able to like, uh, you know, share stories like yours and, and a whole lot of other people, uh, even if I'm not actually in Portland anymore, you know, and, uh, and uh seeing where all this stuff goes but uh yeah you know dr steve is on the horizon and you know i can't complain about that <laughs> and so uh uh but yeah oh so there's there's one thing that i always ask people that come on the show it's uh uh given that this is a focused around sort of the the nuances of like black experiences for like people in in portland it's like, what is the blackest thing that you've done in Portland? <laughs> the blackest thing that I've done. Well, recently I was told by an elder, the blackest thing that I did was I came to a meeting at 11 a.m. smoking a blunt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um. I would say outside of that, goodness, uh, I don't know. I feel like we kind of like live in just Black Portland, right? Like we are around Black people all the time. We go to Black-owned businesses. I don't know. Um, that's a really good question. I mean, when I was younger, I'd be like probably like some kind of a party or... <laughs> That's a hard question, Stephen. That's a really it's, hard question. My, I've gotten, I've gotten a spectrum of answers from, from sort of the stereotypical stuff to the like, I've never even thought that was even possible type of stuff. Like it, it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting question to to ask uh, from my point of view. <laughs> I'd say Black History Month when we're in town, we go really hard with like going to events, being around folks, um, being intentional about, I mean, we're always intentional about the restaurants and stuff that we eat out at, but like, go, like, yeah. I'd say when we're here, cause 
we sometimes are gone for ballet purposes um, in February just because it's uh, audition season. Mm. Uh, but I'd say, like, surprisingly, we've had many, many black, like, hella black experiences. I'd say one of my kids, like, he created a really black experience at the, uh, uh, what is it, the Armory, mm. Portland Center Stage, and he he did like a performance with all of his like very black art <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, in the space. And that was like super, that was during, was that during Black History Month? He's waving at me. I don't know. I can't remember, <laughs> but that was like, that was probably one of like the blackest, one of them experience I've had in Portland. Yeah. It's hard here because it's like you'll have black experiences, but it'll be like a lot of white people around. Yeah. Well, it's a, you know, thanks to 2020, it's like Portland is like the center of like, you know, black. um, Portland is like the center of, you know, activism at this point for, for, (laughs) it's just. It is definitely a hot, well, it's always been a hot spot for activism and a political hot spot just based off of like our history here. But it's definitely blowing up for sure. Yeah. It's, it's a, interesting how people are engaging with that. With, knowing how Portland is, it's really interesting to see how things have turned out. Uh, seeing what mm-hmm. Portland is known for, knowing what Portland is, it's like, huh. Well, that's new. <laughs> like (laughs) it's uh uh, and i and i didn't realize that until i was talking to people that aren't from portland i say oh i'm from like i'm in portland and they'd be like like, what's up (laughs) i'd be like no it's it's literally i regularly my friends from everywhere else will hit me up with newspaper articles or (laughs) You know, did this really happen? Is this at your house? I'll be like, first of all, calm down. Like, yeah. I don't live downtown. And they'll be like, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah. Or when this was last summer when, like, this night, I don't know, was all these protests happening, like, a bank was lit on fire. And for, I just, I got so yeah. many people hit me up. And I was literally like, y'all bugging. I definitely don't live downtown. I don't live in the bank. Like, yeah. I well, the crazy make- part is that, like, I do live downtown. So, like, all that stuff was, like, you know, in, right like, it your- was happening, like, it was happening off of NATO. And, and so it was like, I was like, yes, I know all the stuff, you know, and, uh, but oh. it wasn't, it wasn't like that bad, though. Like, it, it was, it was, it was crazy. It was wild. But I was like, dang, you know. People they, definitely uh, dramatize a lot of oh, it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it was definitely over dramatized, uh, but people were getting snatched up, and I was in meetings with people that had black eyes because they got hit with batons. I was oh yeah, like, I like, protested it, last summer. <laughs> I like I don't be out there in the same extent, but like I've been an activist in those spaces forever. Um, I did a lot of interfacing with uh, our local government and the police last summer, and even well right now not so much anymore but <laughs> yeah <laughs> I had a standoff at race talks with the police chief and it didn't go very well um <laughs> we have very different opinions of what they do every day um yes. so yeah but just yeah that was wild i did a lot of jail support last summer and just like the things were happening but it was also like a lot of people were out they were not there really for black lives matter they're really you know they yeah. were just because they wanted a fight or a party and it it was just a convenient excuse to sort of be destructive well it's a convenient excuse to do what portland is kind of known for Mm -hmm. you know it's a like if you if you look at you know just all the history with uh what is it like the dales or like just just all the stuff that like sort of gets that that black people people of color sort of get the you know, bear the grunt of like, Mm -hmm. you know, like white freedom. (laughs) Like it's a, it it really played out exactly like the way you would expect it to. Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, and. But it also didn't fully like, 
there was a lot of disconnect of like, what are we actually doing? Right. Yeah. Like, I think this is, I was told this is a sign that I'm becoming old that like, I truly believe a lot of this work has to be changed in policy. Like, yeah. please don't burn my local grocery store down because I need them. <laughs> like I will die. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot grow all my vegetables. I guess I, I have farm connects now, but nonetheless, like it's, that's a very unique situation <laughs> right yeah like i need the grocery store to be on and popping and functioning just fine please so like i think there's a lot of disconnect in in how we um move things forward and i will say that's like i'm this is very privileged i went to college i have a lot of friends that are you know in really interesting um positions of influence and some in positions of power at this point yeah and so I have a different understanding of both our systems at work and access points and, you know, realistic pathways to liberation. None of them really include us like fighting the police. Yeah. It's like <laughs> in, 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 in an ideal world where, you know, the, the, the plans and the intersections, inter like the plans intersect. Uh, it's like, okay, you going to burn that down? cool you better have the capital to buy purchase that land and and build up something that that you own otherwise it's like what was the whole point of this you know like you have to there has to be there has to be you know a sort of yeah larger plan like you can't just ransack something and not conquer it and like make it your own you just leave it there (laughs) <laughs> like so, I mean, you know there, like, the system's broken but there are lots of things that we can use that we just need to pivot to make this like to make it make sense or to make yeah. it work right for you me know, i always yeah. boil things down like is this ethical or is it not yeah. right like if this is ethical then like let's, let's let's make let's make the pivot so whatever we're talking about is ethical and that changes the game that changes everything and it's interesting not every you know, doctors, you have to like, you're supposed to like make an, an ethic code. Right. But not yeah. a lot of professions do that. Marketing people, development oh, yeah. people, they've <laughs> never heard about ethics. They'd be like, ethics, what? Huh? Yeah, is that it, a club? Is that a place? You like, got to take an oath. You got to do this. Like, if you don't, like, you're not going to get accepted. You're like, there's, there's real consequences to not doing the things that like, you're supposed to do the ex- uh, live up to the expectation. It's a yeah. and not saying that it's like a perfect process, but there's at least there's like if you tell a doctor or bring up ethics to a doctor, like they're at least they Rules don't of have engagement. Stuff. Like yeah, there's there's, honor, there's a there's a code of honor. Like it, yeah. <laughs> there's a, a lot code of, of honor. Professions, a lot of spaces there's not, and a lot of even within activism work, right? Like a lot of people are not you know, they're not connected to that. And really ethics is this whole larger, bigger conversation. But at the end of it, is this right or wrong? Is this harming people or not? And like, even within an activism spaces, like we got to start like kind of coming back to that. Like, and it's a real simple thing to boil down to, but if we're like really navigating from that center, everything changes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And so, uh, and so with it again, I, I appreciate the time hopping on the podcast with me, chatting, uh, dropping some gems of knowledge and, and sharing a little bit of the journey. Uh, where can people find, uh, learn more about what you're doing and, and the stuff that you have uh, going on? Yeah, folks can find us on our website, which is www.equalgivingcircle.org. Um, we're also on Instagram and Facebook. I'd say Instagram is our best. I think we're on Twitter too, but like nobody ever gets on there because Twitter is crazy. Uh, um, you know, is it? It's yeah. distracting. It's, uh, it's, it's a madness sometimes. Yeah. Um, so we are, I'd say Instagram is the best like social media avenue to connect with us. We post regularly. Um, we're pretty engaged there. Um we have on our website, you can donate on our website. You also can sign up to be, if you are a BIPOC person, um, to get into our programming. Um, we are also always looking for volunteers for across the color line. So if you hop on our, um, I think it's the provide page and our website is going to get another little facelift in a little bit. Um, but there are some forms on there. So you can sign up to volunteer with us because, uh, we need more human power to move the work. Um, 
definitely hit that donate link. We always need a few dollars. Um, yeah, check us out online and hopefully we will see people more in person as, I don't know, the world turns and we see what happens next. Yep. You know, fingers crossed. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Hopefully, hopefully things, uh, uh, well, hopefully things don't get worse and then hopefully things get better because if they start opening up and then things get worse, I'll be <laughs> Yeah, then there's just, <laughs> there just some nonsense, right? <laughs> and I'll so, be inside. Yeah. And so, uh, again, really appreciate the time and everything. Uh, definitely, we're going to drop some of the links and everything. And uh, yeah, yeah, you know, just best of luck with everything. Uh, you know, Thank as you. you as you start to ex- continue to expand, right? Yeah. Like, you yeah. Know, like, uh, a year under your belt and and you guys are still moving so it's it's good to see it's good to see that uh you know it's good to see that you know that flourish thank you appreciate you black rose pdx podcast is recorded at the soul district business association office in collaboration with flossom media we are located off of northeast martin luther king jr boulevard in portland oregon this podcast is recorded mixed and mastered by stephen christian Background music is provided by Spring Gang at Epidemic Sound. Follow us on all social media platforms at PDX Black Rose. P D X B L A C K R O S E. Give us a rate and review on your favorite podcast platform like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and many more. Click the subscribe button to get notified about new episodes. And make sure to share this podcast with your friends and family. Thank you.